Hello, I'm Barbara Peters. Welcome to another episode of The Criminal Calendar. We've gone to America's heartland today for our guest, Alex Kama. Hi, Alex. Hi, Barbara. Tell me this, is Nebraska thick on the ground with crime writers? No, not really. Um, I would say I'm probably one of the uh, few crime writers in Nebraska right now. We do have a few. Um, Sean Doolittle comes from that part of the, the state, or that part of the country. Um, and he's writing a little bit different kind of a mystery now. Um, but I'm probably the only crime writer right now from Nebraska. I thought so. I mean, you know, there are clusters of them. Phoenix recently has begun to grow for a long time. We had very few here. And in the last five or six years, the population's increased. And then you look at cities like even Santa Fe has a disproportionate number of writers. So I'm always kind of curious about why it is that people don't, you know, group in a particular spot. What, what would be your, your thought about Nebraska? Well, it surprises me about Phoenix because there's so much good crimes out here. I mean, it's just it's kind of funny stuff with the desert. and um, Nebraska, I'm not really sure. You know, we have the Charlie Starkweather thing that probably spawned a few crime writers here and there. Um, but, you know, Nebraskans, it seems like, are really tough on their writers. Um, Willa Cather was um, the one book one Nebraska choice before my book was chosen. And before that, they'd never ever chosen even a live author. And they really do have a lot of respect for the, um, you know, the past uh, and history. But it's taken me a while to even kind of take hold there in Nebraska. So do you, I mean, writers lead theoretically kind of lonely lives, you know, home in a little room. Boring lives. Yeah, well, that too, with your computer and all. But a lot of them say that they are always in danger of spending too much time with other writers. Uh, because they're in kind of a, a nest of it, you know, and it's mm -hmm. easy to go do that. Do you find yourself feeling kind of isolated? I am kind of isolated, I guess, in that respect. Uh, ever since ITW, International Thriller Writers, uh, started a couple of years ago, it's been a little bit different because I've gotten to know some of those writers and, and gone out to dinner with them and sort of enjoyed that. But no, I mean, pretty much I've been alone, um, except for a conference here and there. Um, there aren't really that many opportunities in Nebraska to get together with other writers, unfortunately. And you published your first book in 2000, but if I remember right, you quit your sort of salary day job, what, in 1996 or something? Yes, yes. How'd you get along for those four years till you got a book in print? Uh, it, was, it was tough. You know, I tell people that uh, my roof was leaking and my car died and so did my dog of 15 years. And I was teaching part-time at a, a commercial college, a commercial art college. And uh, I actually had a newspaper delivery route. Uh, I was delivering the Omaha World Herald at like 2 o'clock in the morning on the weekends. So I was, I was making ends meet, barely, uh, while I wrote A Perfect Evil. And it took me about a year and a half to write that novel. And then it took me about a year to actually find a, an agent and get published. So those were really tough times. I mean, savings depleted quickly. I pretty much lived off my credit cards. I maxed out my credit cards to, to pay bills and to pay the mortgage because I did have a mortgage even though the roof was leaking. Um, those were very, very tough years. But I kind of told myself that if I wasn't published by the time I was 40, that I'd just kind of put it all aside and, and just kind of forget about it um, and find a real job again. But um, fortunately for me, A Perfect Evil was published like three days before my 40th birthday. Wow, that was a squeaker. It was. Yeah, I'll give a similar story to Lindsay Davis. And actually quite a few writers have said that they stepped aside from the mundane to give themselves a chance and put a time limit on it. And many of them did come, or have come, right up to the wire. I think I'm better with deadlines, even self-imposed deadlines. Because if I had tried to write novels while I was still doing PR full time, I, I don't think I could have done it. It's just too draining. Well, there is that. Um, did you have time to accumulate a second book while you were waiting for the first one to publish? I kind of did, but then they decided that Maggie O'Dell, who um, was my FBI profiler in uh, A Perfect Evil, had sort of become sort of a commodity, is what my publisher felt. And so they wanted another Maggie O'Dell. And I didn't have, I didn't have paragraph one of another Maggie O'Dell. Um, if I remember correctly, she doesn't even come into A Perfect Evil until like chapter seven. So I didn't even intend uh -huh. to do a series. Right. I did have another book. It's never been published. Um, really? It's probably about halfway through, and now my style has changed so much, I don't know that I could go back to it. 
Well, I mean, I'm sure the practice part of it was good for you regardless. Oh, it was very good. Very good. And you might be able to cannibalize some plot element at some point. I, mean, I, think I don't I, think any of these ever really wasted for a writer, is it? No, not really, because there's there probably are characters that I could go back to in that one and, and sort of use in another, maybe a standalone. Well, um, your first book, A Perfect Evil, really sort of catapulted you to a fairly high level. What was it about that book you think that caught everybody's attention? You know, I'm not sure. I, I think worldwide, I think it was Maggie, which sort of surprises me because Maggie kind of grinds on my nerves sometimes. Uh, in fact, that's why I needed to do a standalone, because I was so sick of her that I just wanted to do something, anything other than Maggie O'Dell. And I think part of that comes from not being prepared to write a series. I didn't have a clue as to how to write a series. Um, uh, okay, so w you didn't really design one at the outset? No, not at all. And, and in A Perfect Evil, you know, I gave her this alcoholic, suicidal mother. Uh, and this husband that she was getting ready to divorce, and I never ever realized that I might actually have to deal with these things. It was sort of nice for her character just to kind of have this baggage, but then I had to deal with that baggage book after book after book. Um, but I think worldwide what I get from people is that they've really connected to Maggie. She's not really the superhero. Um, she has a lot of problems. She has a lot of dysfunction in her own family. And I think that people have related to that. That's, that's about the only explanation I can give because, you know, crime novels are a dime a dozen. There are so many of us out there. Well, the serial killer, I mean, Maggie's books are serial killer books, right? Because she works she's, for the FBI. She's a criminal profiler. Um, and actually, the next one that I'm working on, which is titled Exposed, and it'll come out next summer, she's, it's a little bit different. She's actually working on a killer who, um, trying to identify a killer who is sort of like the Unabomber, only he's using um, the Ebola um, Oh, the Ebola virus? virus right. Yes, as a weapon. So criminal profilers can be used in different cases to identify different killers other than just serial killers. Um, so Maggie's got, uh, I think, a few more legs to run on. Well, that's good, but I do think, um, when did Silence of the Lambs come out as a movie? You know, I'm not sure about that. I want to say, like, maybe 98. Well, your your first book, if it two thousand, was not terribly they far still, distant. Yes, they were still comparing it to right, Silence and of the Lambs. and I think that you know it, it, Silence of the Lambs as a film, because the book had been out longer than that, uh, generated an interest. There's always been an interest in some serial killer thrillers, just as mm -hmm. there is in the you know the PI novel or the courtroom drama or whatever, um, and maybe. Maybe the re one of the reasons Maggie's done well is that people have an enduring fascination with serial killers. They must. They really must. Um, you know, that was something else that when I wrote A Perfect Evil, I, I wasn't really that interested in the serial killer. I sort of based it on a case that happened in Nebraska when I was working for a newspaper. I just graduated from college, and it was uh, the John Jubert case. He had killed two little boys. Uh, one was a paper boy. Um, that went missing on a Sunday morning paper delivery route. And that happened when I was working at the paper. And then 13 years later when I decided to leave civilization and leave my day job and write, um, John Jubert was executed that summer. And the thing that fascinated me about wanting to do a novel sort of kind of loosely based on that was not him, was not the serial killer, was not even the killing so much as that this transformation that the community went through. Because it was a small community south of Omaha. You know, it was this bedroom community that people didn't lock their doors if they went to the store in the middle of the afternoon. And, and all of a sudden, they have their little boys disappearing. And, and that was what I was more interested in, was sort of this fear and this crisis and, and how people can change and transform lives by being wrapped up in something like this. And then shortly after Perfect Evil came out, um, there was a reviewer who called me the, new, the newest serial killer lady. And I didn't even realize that I had written a serial killer novel. Well, in a way, you haven't. Um, and one reason I like your books, I pretty much burned out on serial killer, killer novels because so many of them focus on the killer. And mm -hmm. I'm just not, I'm not that fascinated with how they got so deranged. Mm -hmm. 